Hey guys, so this is going to be chapter five lecture video. Um, so this is the learning objectives. Definitely make sure to check those out in the book. They're important and it's good to know what you should be learning as you move through your chapters. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the Parthenon. Um, this is a very famous, if not the most famous piece of architecture on the Western in the Western sphere, basically. Um, so the Greeks actually, if you see, this is there's a lot of columns on the Parthenon, and that's actually passed down through through the Egyptians. So the Egyptians really were the first peoples to come up with the column, and it originally came from bundles of papyrus, but it was turned into um, kind of more of a stylized form. And the Greeks borrowed that from the Egyptians. They did develop their own artistic identity, despite the fact that they were borrowing from other cultures. They also borrowed from the Mesopotamians as well. The Greek temple though, is definitely a very important piece of architecture even to this day, because there's a lot of influence of Greek temple even in our buildings of today, especially like our political buildings, like the White House or like courthouses, definitely still follow in that same tradition of Greek architecture and Greek temple buildings specifically. So the Parthenon is basically just a attempt of Greek architects to design the most perfect building possible. And the Parthenon was built on the Acropolis of Athens in the mid fifth century BCE. And like I said, the architects are really trying to find a building with the most ideal proportions possible. And the Greeks really believed that beauty resided in harmonic numerical ratios. So they're actually using numbers to and mathematical formulas to come up with the ratios of this building, because they believed that that had to do with order and order over chaos was definitely a huge part of Greek, ancient Greek culture. And the, there was an ancient Greek philosopher um, that really kind of came up with the idea of using mathematical ratios for everything to create order in civilization and in, in, and in art. And so the architect Ictinos, who was the architect of the Parthenon, used very strict calculated dimensions for every part of the Parthenon. So he actually took into the ratio the proportion of the length of the building to the width of the building. And he even took the number of columns on the long and short sides into, into consideration. And he based that on a strict mathematical ratio. And even the relationship between the diameter of each of the columns and the spaces in between are based on a numerical proportion. So this really kind of fits into that idea of order. And the Greeks are really obsessed with the idea of order. You know, if you think about it, the Greek culture and civilization was in itself a form of order. Um, and the Greek civilization was an embodiment of order and the order of man over nature. Um, and nature is often seen as chaotic by the Greeks uh, because you can't control it. And it's kind of scary to be out there and, and you know, not have medicine, not have civilization to fall back on. So um, order over chaos is, and the rejection of nature in a way is actually something that is an underlying theme in Greek art and civilization throughout this chapter and even kind of translates to our society today. So this, this was actually, this Parthenon was built to honor the goddess Athena. Um, and actually her long name is Ar Athena Parthenos, which means Athena the Virgin. And it also served other purposes. It also celebrated the Athenian people themselves. So the Athenian people are the people that lived in Athens in, under the Greek uh, rule, basically. And Athens was a town in Greece or a city in Greece that was very prominent and they actually conquered the Persians. So the Persians came to Greece and tried to conquer Greece, but the Athenians were able to drive them out of Greece. So 
like we had talked about in the Egypt chapter, the Persians did conquer Egypt, um, but they they did they were not able to take Greece. And that's because of the Athenians. And so the Athenians really used the Parthenon to show off the fact that, you know, the Athenians were a great race of people. We, they were mighty. And it really commemorates their victory over the Persians. So there's a lot of reliefs inside of Greek warriors battling with um, a part horse, part man, which is actually called a centaur. And the centaur symbolizes the barba barbaric Persians. And so the Greeks are... are it, depicted inside um, battling these barbaric um, centaurs and they're winning because you know the Greeks win and so it's just the reliefs inside the Parthenon really are symbols of the Greek s civilization's victory over other cultures and specifically the the Persians and there's just a lot of human related events that are depicted in this side of this temple and which is a little unusual because before this, it was all um, depictions of gods or goddesses. So um, it's one of the first instances of human events that is shown on the inside of a temple. And Phidias is the master sculpture, and he actually created a huge golden ivory statue of Athena that was originally located inside of the Parthenon. And it was basically... Um, depicting her as holding a winged personification of victory and then another, you know, which was a symbol of victory over the Persians. And the Greeks believed humans were the measure of all things. And this kind of remi also remains like a fundamental um, thing that we still have in our society today. Um, and the Greeks were the first to develop democracy, which is ruled by the people, rule by the people, and demo means people. Um, and they're they also made a lot of groundbreaking contributions to art, you know, math, science, literature, philosophy, those kinds of things. So, um, oh, and here's the inner friezes that depict, you know, some of the human related events. And here is the Greek world. So the Greeks, they believe, were probably a product of the Aegean peoples mixed with the Dorians from the north and the Ionians from Asia Minor in the west. So um, that's kind of where they're thinking, which is kind of a big mixture of all these people, and that became the Greeks. We don't know how all of them came together to form the ancient Greek culture, but we do know that in 7076 BCE, this pre group of people got together and they held their first Olympic Games at Olympia um, in Greece. And from then on, the Greeks developed a sense of nationality, and they called themselves the Hellas. Um, and we've, we've heard Hellas uh, before, but the Greeks did share a common language and a common culture, but it was a pretty diverse area. I mean, it's fairly large area for this time period anyway, to have that large of a, of a footprint in a society is unusual. They're pretty self-centered people. They're considered their culture to be superior and all the other people were considered like barbarians. And the Greek gods were different from those of the civilizations of like say Mesopotamia or Egypt. Um, the Greeks gods and goddesses were basically human in form. The only thing that really made them different was that they were immortal. And humans actually had the potential to become gods by fulfilling heroic ideals. So once again, we see that ideal the, the idea of the ideal, um, of the perfect. So these ideals of perfection and order over chaos is definitely one of those fundamental themes that we'll see again and again in ancient Greek culture. And the focus on humans as being the center of the world is apparent when taken to, into consideration that they believe that gods are human in form and that, you know, if you do enough heroic tasks that you can become yourself a god is just backing up that thought that humans are the center of the world for the Greeks, um, the ancient Greeks. So, so one thing to remember is that, you know, the, the art that we're looking at from this chapter comes from all over Greece and they have a lot of colonies abroad as well. And so it's quite diverse geographically, but Athens is really the center of the civilization, which is right here. So Athens is kind of the most important kind of the center of where most of the artists and architects and philosophers 
resided. They resided in a Athens. And athletics were obviously very important to the people of Athens. And, you know, the Olympics are from this culture, right? That's been passed down into our current culture. Um, so that's an influence from the Greek culture as well as is the Olympics. And so there was this idea floating around in Greece at the time that um, the body could be perfected and so could the mind. And it's kind of where we get that idea of a sound, by, a sound mind and a sound body. Um, so the Greeks did develop democracy, but only 2% of the population of Greece could vote. So most of the population was made up of women, children, and slaves, and women were not equal to men in Greek society. They raised the children, they stayed at home, they only came out for certain festivals or ceremonies, so they were not at all um, equal to men in Greek society. So we will start off with the geometric period. Let me check and just make sure how much time. Okay, we have a little bit of time. So, so after the destruction of the Mycenaean palaces around 12,000 BCE, the Aegean civilization entered into the Dark Age of Greece. Well, they call it the Dark Age because there's really not a lot of art that's being left behind from the civilizations. They believe, you know, there might have been something that happened, you know, potentially like, you know, famine or um, disease that may have struck at this point and really kind of just decreased the virility of human settlement in this area. And so we have this long area of Dark Age in Greece, but in the 8th century BCE, things kind of begin to pop back up and things start improving for people. And and so this era is really the era that um, was an important time. And it was basically marked by the establishment of that the Olympic Games, which I had mentioned previous, and also was the conception of Homer's epic poems, which is the Iliad and the Odyssey, which we kind of talked on um, in the ancient Aegean chapter, which was last week. And the Greeks also built a tr wide trade network, so they began building a, tr a wide trade network. So we start we start to see culture kind of coming back a little bit. Um, so the first period of art that we'll cover is the geometric art of ancient Greece. And so it, the 8th century was also a time when we start seeing the reemergence of the human figure in Greek art. And it's mostly done in small scaled figurines and paintings on ceramic pots. So we have a lot of ceramic pots from the geometric period. So this is a, a geometric period crater which is used a vessel using used for mixing wine and water. And it's from the Depylon Cemetery in Athens, Greece, 740 BCE. It's about three feet, four and a half inches high. Um, so it's fairly large. And it really does depict some very early representations of Greek figure painting. And it's really the testimony of, it's a testimony to the wealth of the man. And it was actually used as a, a grave marker so it was a testimony to the wealth of that man. And the bottom of the vessel is opened to allow visitors to pour libations in or offerings of liquid in to offer the dead so they can just pour it right through and it'll go onto the man's grave below. And most of the surface of this crater, as you can see, is completely covered with decoration. And the painter of this piece um, and another in four in the book is thought to be from the same artist, and they call him the Dipylon painter. And all of his works obviously are found in the Dipylon cemetery in Athens. And horizontal bands are common throughout, and there is kind of a meander. It's called a meander or a key pattern right here at the top of the rim of the vase that goes all the way around. And we can a lot of we see a lot of geomet geometric abstraction and pattern in this piece. So that might be partially why, why it's called geometric period, but there's a lot of geometric shapes and, and pattern present. And the widest part of the vase, um, we can see that human figure and a horse-drawn chariot. So we can see some people here. There's a person here on top of this chariot with this, some horses. Here's some more people, I believe, holding shields. 
Um, and here's a depiction of the dead man right here. So the scene at the top, that shows the 